Good morning. Uh, and welcome to the uh, SED Center lecture uh, this, this morning. And our lecturer is Dr. Ilsup Ahn, Carl I. Lindbergh Professor of Philosophy at North Park University and Carnegie Council Global Ethics Fellow. He's also an ordained elder in the Northern Illinois Conference of the United Methodist Church. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in Philosophy from Yonsei University, Master of Divinity and Master of Theology degrees from Emory University, and Doctor of Philosophy degree in Religious Ethics from the University of Chicago, that other institution in Hyde Park. He's the author of three books, Position and Responsibility, Religious Ethics and Migration, Doing Justice to Undocumented Workers, and Asian American Christian Voices, issue, Voices, Issues, Methods. He has also published scholarly articles <coughs> related to social ethics on immigration and environment in peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Religious Ethics, Journal of Church and State, Cross Currents, Journal of Global Ethics, Political Theology, and other numerous titles. His research and publications have focused on such areas as religion and politics, immigration justice, religious environmental ethics, and Asian Christian ethics. Um, Dr. Ahn also has some very cl close and tight connections with Garrett. But I will leave it to him whether he wishes to divulge it or not. <laughs> will you please join me in welcoming Professor Ahn who will lecture this morning on just debt and unjust credit, the question for monetary justice in an age of neoliberalism. That's fine. Okay, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Il Saban. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I'm trying to share some of my research work that I have been doing for the past couple of years, and the topic for today's uh, presentation is just that and unjust credit. Um, <clears throat> yesterday, I had a chance to uh, look myself, the photo on the poster, and I felt like, wow, what a stern face. <laughs> and then I felt like, well, these guys look like debt collector. <laughs> well, I'm not standing here as a debt collector here. I, I want to talk about that today. But before getting into this lecture session, I would like to offer my deepest thanks and uh, appreciation, Dr. Brent Waters and the State Center and uh, the Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Thank you so much. And also, my deepest uh, appreciation to you all. Look outside, the weather is so great. I, I bet um, this is a great kind of temptation to go outside and then do something, but you are here. So I, I had some debt you know, owed to you. So by the end of this lecture, I hope I'm going to pay all of my debt. Okay, without any further ado, let me just go ahead and talk about the case. The case of farmer suicide in India. United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, they issued a report in nine, uh, 2008. According to the report, more than 86,000 Indian farmers committed suicide. Now, if a human toll is taken that magnitude, you can think something structural and systematic is going on behind the scene, right? So the researchers teamed up together by two universities, Cambridge University and the University of London. They sent uh, their researchers to uh, India, southern India, and they discovered three commonalities. The first commonality is that these farmers, they have a small farmland, just about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 hectares, not even one hectare. So we can imagine these farmers are poor. The second commonality is that these farmers were trying to grow cash crop. Cash crop is like you know, cotton and coffee. And cotton and coffee are notoriously susceptible to international price fluctuations. That means when you are planting these you know, cash crops, that you are in risky situation. Anyway, they did it. The third commonality is that they all went in debt. So you can imagine. How these farmers doing all this business for years? Now, you know, they certainly got into all this debt. So they really tried to get into the real situation, and they discovered one common thing, GMCs, genetically modified seeds. So the global corporations, like you know, Monsanto, 
they entice them to, you know, these cash crops, you know, promising that you're going to make a lot of money. So many of these you know, farmers, they're illiterate. They don't know what is going on. They don't even, you know, able to read the legal documentation, things like that. The problem is these, these GMCs are quite expensive. For example, 10 pounds, you can buy only 100 grams of, you know, cotton seeds. So it is expensive. How expensive, actually? It is like a 1,000 times more expensive than the traditional seeds. So it is very, very expensive. And, you know, since they don't have money, so what would they do? So they went to the local, you know, money lenders and they drew out the money. But the problem is that the interest rate is like 35%, you know, is a killer rate. But because of the global warming and, you know, climate change and stuff, um, it didn't rain. And at the end of the day, the harvest was pretty bad. So now they are end them, sitting on the huge piles of that. And they are continuously harassed by, you know, creditors. And they, they couldn't pay. And they are pressured to sell their lenders, things like that. So at the end of the day, they just went out and terminate their own lives. So the reason I'm telling you this story is that in today's world, the problem of that is not personal. It's not private. It is deeply structural and systematic. Now, back in the United States, well, some people might say that this is a U.S. This is an Indian, you know, case. What about the United States? Let's talk about, you know, the U.S. financial crisis, two thousand seven and eight. I believe that still we are in the living in the lingering tale of this financial debacle that happened, two thousand seven and eight. And many researchers, including economists, there is some kind of consensus. The consensus is. Subprime mortgage is part of the reason of this, you know, huge problem. What is a subprime mortgage? Subprime mortgage is basically, you know, this type of loan given to the debtors who have relatively lower scores, about like less than 600 points and things like that. So that means it's not likely they're going to pay back their own debt. But you know what happened 2007 and eight before that era? It was not debtors. It was creditors, the bankers. They were chasing after people. And they said, that, just come and borrow the money from us. We're not going to check anything. You don't need to provide any documentation, no docs, right? So it is quite interesting. Let me ask you, if someone is coming to you whom you couldn't trust, and then they are saying that, OK, can I borrow money from you? Would you be willing to lend money to the people who, whom you, can, you know, can't trust? Probably not. But people in 2007 and 8, these things happen all of the, I mean, basically across the country. So it is a strange, right? So why these things happen? Why the, you know, the creditors are chasing after us and then say that, please come and then borrow the money. We're not going to check any background from you guys. That kind of things. Why? Because there was a financial innovation. This is uh, what you know, economists are talking about. According to financial, you know, this innovation, when I borrow, for example, $150,000 from the bank A, from my perspective, it is a debt. From bankers' perspective, it could be their financial asset. Because they believe that I'm going to pay all these principles plus what interest charges at the end of the day. So if it is a financial asset, then it can be sold out, right? So they turn this debt into their financial commodities. So it is hugely profitable. So they did it. And that's how we all end up that kind of financial crisis 2007 and 8. It was really crazy friends at the time. But I want to tell you, tell you, this thing is not just a financial problem. It is a deeply social problem. I have one neat chart on your on the right side. This is a suicide uh, you know, level chart. You know, traditionally, in the United States, the people in their 70s and 80s, they are the number one group who committed suicide in the United States. Okay. But 2007, Something new happened. For the first time in decades, the people in their 40s and 50s, they topped over 70s and 80s in you know, a group of people. Why? Because these group of people are the ones who borrow money from the bank. And the house now on the market is pure sale. And then probably their you know, family members got in trouble because of the financial problems. And then many people committed suicide. That's what we call economic suicide. And how many people across the country and Europe? over 10,000 people. That was discovered by the researchers from the University of Oxford. So we have here a huge problem. It's not just economic problem, it's deeply social problem. That's what I'm saying. 
um, when it comes to the case of debt. You know, these cases, the Indian farmer suicide and the U.S. financial you know, meltdown, all these cases, actually iceberg. It's a tip of iceberg known as financialization. I don't know how many of you heard about this term, financialization. So what is the financialization? It is basically, in a very simple term, is a growing dominance of capital market financial system. That means, in a very simplistic term, it's like the financial sectors, they are making more and more money compared to a traditional you know, industries like uh, commerce and you know, trading and you know, manufacturing business. So these financial sectors are growing in exponentially. Here we have two charts. As you can see on the, the left chart, since 1980s, you can see the total debt has been hiked up so precipitously. Enormous amount of debt is inc increased during the time. And then here on the right side, you see there are two X lines the blue line is the manufacturing size and their profit rate against the GDP. 1950s is almost like you know, 30%. Now it's a little bit over 10%. On the reverse side, the financial sectors, in 1950s is about 10%. Now it's almost like 25%. This chart shows that the financial sector has grown up enormously. And the financial, uh, the financial education, um, doesn't come without any payment. It comes, on, comes along with some you know, results, some effects. Here I have a three, you know, a list here. As it's, the first effect of financialization is a dangerous pro, uh, proliferation of debt. You know, debt here in the United States in today's uh, you know, situation, we have more than $19 trillion of national debt, right? And that's uh, dwarfed by another uh, kind of a, you know, a mind-boggling amount of derivatives markets. I don't know how many heard about derivatives markets. So what is derivative? Derivative is kind of a, a security. It's, it's like an economic you know, contract uh, whose price actually derived from underlying assets like a bond and you know, um, uh, you know, stocks and commodities. It's sometimes even a, a, you know, event or weather, basically. So this derivative market has been exponentially grown. Now, 2014, the total the nominal value of derivative market topped $630 trillion. You heard me right, trillion. The US GDP this year is about $19 trillion. So you can imagine how big this derivative market is out there. It's all computerized, and then trading is going on every day. And then on a daily basis, only for the you know, foreign exchange rate, you know, all this trading is more than $1 trillion every day. So it's a huge amount of money is going on in every day. That's a financialization. The second one is systematic exploitation of vulnerable debtors. Um, you remember 1997, there was a huge financial crisis in Asia, particularly Thailand, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, and South Korea. They had a huge problem at the time. You know, I researched about that case, and actually in 1994, Mexico got into trouble because of that, you know. But we have to see, behind all these, you know, financial crisis, there is always huge, you know, financial hands, like George Soros and, you know, hedge funds and virtual funds and people like them. They viciously attacked national you know, currency in order to devalue their currency. And unfortunately, their attack is successful. That means when the currency level is devalued, they're going to have a huge financial burden because the import prices hiked up, and then they're going to buy more you know, taxes and stuff. And then people basically, they just put out to the street because of that. But what is going on in Wall Street at the time when you know, Mexico got into trouble, the people in you know, Wall Street, they actually cracked open their champagne and they celebrated. Why more than 10,000 people committed suicide across Asia at the time? So this is the world we are living, and I think this is a huge problem. And that is a systematic exploitation of the vulnerable debtors. The third effect is detrimental concentration of wealth on financial renters. As you can see in this chat, uh, chart, the top 1% got that so much. This is not income. 
this is wealth. Personally, I don't really care about how this one person got away. It's not a problem for me. It's $1 million and $10 million, billion dollar, the same to me, actually. It's just an astronomical amount of money. But I do care about the people that side, 70% of you know, U.S. population. They got only 7% of the total wealth we created together. Now let us take a look at 40%. Their number is not even registered. So, so many people, I'm talking about hundreds, billions of people are living in that huge, enormous poverty level. And they are actually your church members, actually. We need to get into a little deeper in order to understand financialization. Thomas Piketty, uh, I know, you, perhaps you heard this, uh, this guy's name, he's young, um, he's prominent you know, a uh, French economist. He published a book, Capital in the 21st Century, last year. It was a huge success, you know. New York Times bestseller book hit, and then after his publication, he got into a public debate with uh, a conservative, you know, Harvard economists in, you know, Massachusetts, and it was pretty interesting. But in this book, he, um, his book actually epitomized this one law-like, you know, formula. He's a computer you know, kind of genius. He basically processed an enormous amount of economic data for the past 100 years. And then he realized that there is some kind of law-like formula, R is always greater than G. So what is R? Um, R is annual rate of return on capital, and G is like here, um, you know, annual growth of the economy. The simple rule of this you know, formula says, if you're going to invest money in finance sectors, you're going to always win. Because the finance sectors and their you know, um, you know, profit rate is always greater than, greater than the overall you know, uh, level of you know, profit created by over, uh, the other economies. Right? So that is the, the epitome of the financialization. But we have to understand financialization. Why is the problem? So from the bird eye perspective, it goes this way. Our society, we have economy, and more and more, the money is going to be concentrated in financial sectors. That means in Main Street sectors, they are losing and running out of money because money is getting into more and more funnel into financial sectors. So what will happen to NFC, non-financial corporations? They are running out of money. They have a problem in terms of getting more and more money, right? That is the situation. What happened? Because corporations, you know, our Main Street corporations, since they don't have enough money, they're going to cut their workforces, firing. And then good jobs now turned into a part-time jobs. And then benefits are cut. I believe that many agencies out there, including schools, our schools, have, you know, are being affected by this new trend. So this financialization is deeply, you know, affecting our lives. I was thinking about financial education, and then I started a little more and, and, and researched it. And this seemingly economic trend is not really economic, actually. There is a background ideological and philosophical kind of movement. Uh, from my perspective, Jeremy Bentham is the major guy who actually you know, funded this new kind of a phenomenon that happened since then, is the financial education. In 1787, he published a book titled Defense of Usury. We have to understand in 18th century in England, still they have anti-usury laws. And then anti-usury law was, you know, uh, regarded as sort of like a natural law kind of things. So uh, at the time in England, they have about 5% of anti-usury you know, usury limit. And Jeremy Vendham argued anti-usury law is, is problematic. So basically, he deconstructs anti-usury law, arguing this way. The legal rate of usury law is nothing but a customary convention, which can be reduced to a matter of convenience. So his basic argumentation is, by providing all these kind of examples, for example, like in ancient Romans, their usury rate was about 11%, and West Indies at the time, about like 8%, England, 5%, and sometimes 
like a constant in Europe, they have a whopping like 30 percent rate. So, you know, Bindam's basic argumentation is this usury law is not, you know, inherent, is not natural law kind of stuff. It is based on actually our choice. It is a matter of convenience. So his basic through the argumentation is this usury law is nothing but a convention. At the end of the day, our convenience matters. So effectively, this choice and a text sort of natural law basis. So what is the result? I think this is a real major thing. The moral concept of debt and its phenomena is now converted into a debt or finance as a matter of an amoral. That means morally neutral customary fact. So financialization is not merely a matter of economics. That's why I'm saying. Because behind this facade and movement, there is a strong philosophical and ideological background. You know, General Bentham is generally not known that much to the people like us, but General Bentham is very popular among, you know, economists, actually. In 1970, the, um, the, the group of, you know, Chicago School of you know, Economics and Business, you know, Milton Friedman, he published an article in, New, in Newsweek magazine. The title of the article was Defense of Usury, actually. And his basic argumentation was General Bentham uh, was right. And I uh, read other articles written by, you know, um, economists. They basically cited him. So General Bandam is very popular, actually. And also I realized General Bandam, he wrote many religious books, actually. And then his major argumentation was religion is, is just just problem. So before Nietzsche, there was General Bandam, actually. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Well, here is my point. It's, even though it is seemingly amoral, what is really happening around in the amoral world is immoral behavior. So economists and these ideologists and the philosophers, the argumentation is that, well, the word e economy, the word of finance, is basically self-standing, a separate own word, running on its own law, like invisible hands, and R is always greater than G kind of stuff. But actually, what is really happening in the world of a moralized world is not the prolongation of a moral phenomenon. No, not really. Actually, a moral concept, the, the amoral is now degraded into the immoral. Let, let me give you, actually, I can give the tons of examples and many ideas. But here I have two examples. The first example is the Goldman Sachs. Everybody knows Goldman Sachs, right? Goldman Sachs in 2012, they uh, sold about $100 million worth of, you know, mortgage-backed securities to um, um, the basis yield alpha company. Uh, this company is a hedge fund company from Australia, basically, but they didn't share the information. Basically, they lied to these funds. And their argumentation is that, well, you just buy this, and it's going to fly. Then you're going to make a lot of money. But actually, while they were selling this, you know, mortgage-backed security to this company, they were betting against it behind the scene in order to fetch a lot of money by doing this. So years, you know, several years later, the basis, the company, they went bankrupt because they lost a lot of money. They realized later they, they did these kind of things you know, behind the scene. So they sued. And I just tracked down their stories. And this year, June, finally the US court, they made a decision and now Goldman Sachs, they have to pay. So they are making some kind of, you know, kind of concessions with the uh, basis. That is one example how the amoral world is now degenerated into immoral kind of, you know, you know, direction. Perhaps you heard about the payday loans, right? I read a story about Raymond Cheney. So Raymond Cheney is 66 years old. He's living on basically a government, um, the social secret, you know, you know, you know Techa. Uh, several years ago, he got into trial because his car broke, and then he fixed a car, and it cost him about like $400. He didn't have that money. So what he did? He loaned the money from the payday loans. And the payday loan is very interesting. It's very problematic. It's like a 14-day cycle. So you draw like $100, and you pay $15 you know, fee, 
if you're not going to pay back fifteen, you know, fifteen days later, another, you know, uh, uh, fee and also a penalty and the interest charge and things like that. So after drawing four hundred dollars, he couldn't pay it back. And then in order to overcome the situation, draw the money another, you know, pay their loans. Now, if you get into that situation, you are in big trouble. So at the end of the day, he borrowed more than three thousand dollars. And the total debt is $12,000. And he kicked out from his apartment. And during the daytime, he went to public library and read the newspaper. Sometimes it's, you know, depending on, you know, uh, soup kitchen, or food, and things like that. Now, here's, here is a real alarming thing. How many US citizens are involved with this payday loan trouble? 12 million people. These people are living between $15 and $400, $400 level. You know, according to research, many of these people, their annual income is between $10,000 and $20,000, poverty level. So they can pay $15, but they cannot pay $400. The pay payday loan companies, they see as business opportunity. So basically what I understand is, these companies are feeding off of this poverty and turned into a huge economic you know, opportunity. So that's why we have to think about the problem of that from an ethics perspective. So my question now is, how can we reconstruct an ethics of debt, right? Probably many of you think that debt is a bad thing. Oh, debt, I don't want to even talk about that kind of stuff. Then, probably the, uh, the logical uh, consequence, you know, sequence is that then probably debt with the society is great. Maybe we should work together to create debt with society and ourselves, right? I was thinking about the concept of debt with the society as a potential solution, and I find the answer or the image of debt with the society inadvertently by reading Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan in 1651, famous book, Leviathan. And then in the book, he was talking about in some kind of imaginary society, the, uh, the, the state of nature. His basic argumentation is before the civilization, there was an original situation, like state of nature. And he says, because there is no government, there is no political authority, people were actually getting engaged warlike situation. So it is about like a world of war against all. And then he just uh, listed a litany of no list, no arts, no industries, you know, no commerce and you know, no institution, all kinds of no. There's no you know, seminar too. You know. And he, he, he didn't miss one thing in that no list. And I realized that he didn't say that. There is no debt in the state of nature. What I'm trying to say is that debt to the society is not necessarily that good. It could be a chaotic society. So maybe we should ask another fundamental question. Is debt necessarily bad? I try to answer uh, this question looking for the answer. And I find a very important insight from anthropologists. You know, anthropologists, they are interesting people, and they came up with a lot of you know, good stuff. In 1950, uh, Marcel Mauss, he published a book titled The Bat. That book is a small book, but its implication is huge. It's a really big book. And then in the book, he argues, uh, raise a question. The question is, what really happened at the beginning of the human society? And then somehow, this is not my inter interpretation. This is a Marshall, you know, Salin's interpretation. Basically, his argumentation goes this way. In the, in the beginning of human society, an archaic society, yes, there was a possibility that we got into warlike situation, war of war against everyone. Yes, there was a possibility. But we didn't get into that situation. We are rational. And according to um, the Marshall Mouse, they came up with a very interesting social mechanism that is give to giving. So gift giving was you know, prevalent in the archaic society. So this gift giving is made it possible to establish some sort of like a social solidarity and cohesiveness 
in that precarious situation. And then he's, he talked about three laws in the archaic society. That must be given, that, I mean, sorry, ah, that then, you know, it keeps sometimes kind of confusing, but gift must be given, gift must be received, and then gift must be returned. So gift giving is not really gift. It is sort of like exchange, you can imagine, right? And then he said, there is no real big qualitative difference between that and gift. So in other way, what we can draw on from his work is, originally in archaic society, that was derived from gift. In other way, that is a form of gift. Because of financialization, we lost that tradition. I, what I'm arguing is that we have to revive that thing. So what does it mean a uh, debt is a form of gift? What is the qualification? So I, I you know, um, went out and then do some other researches in philosophy. And this is the, um, the idea that I have developed uh, from um, the research. And there is a criteria that makes a debt a just debt. In other way, in order for a debt to be a form of gift, this qualification should be met. First qualification, the principle of serviceability. In a, in a very simple way, the debt drawn out from the bank or the creditor should be doing the service work for the creditor. I want to talk about 1970s and 80s, these you know, you know, uh, dictators from the third world countries. They draw a lot of money from the first world and the first world bank. You know, International Financial Institution, IFIs, at the time, actually, these bankers, they knew that these dictators invest the money, and they're not going to use the money for the sake of their own people. So knowing that this, you know, that money is not going to be serviceable for their own people, anyway, they lend the money to the dictators. And I argue that is not just that. That must be servicing to people who draw the money. That is a fundamental principle of just that. Second. The principle of payability. The debt must be payable in order you know, for the debt to be just. Um, let us talk about Australia. Australia student debt. You know what? In the United States, about 70% of you know, people who have BA degrees, they have debt. And then the amount of debt is about, about the, you know, the average debt is about $30,000, so $30,000 to $35,000. And actually, student debt is the second largest consumer debt. Do you know how much money uh, this debt in the United States? $1.3 trillion. We have a huge amount of student debt. And 5 million people, they are in you know, default, actually. So this is another huge issue. But this story is very different in uh, Australia. Australian students, yes, they, they have debt, about $22,000. But the big difference in, in, in Australia, after your graduation, you don't have to pay until your earnings reaches to $40,000. If you're not going to make $40,000, they're not going to you know, send a bill for you. Because you are not payable. You know, this debt is not payable. In the United States, right after your graduation, they're going to send you a bill. You have to pay within 10 years. In Germany, it's 20 years. You know, Sweden, 25 years. You know, uh, England, like you know, 30 years. Each nation have different ways. In some countries, they change the law, and the debt is very much payable. So it is all a matter of politics at the end of the day. The third principle, the, the principle of shareability. What does this mean? Shareability means um, there is a possibility, because of the external you know, uh, you know, impact and some you know, unimagined you know, kind of situation, that can be default. It, it turns out to be insolvent. You know, it is unpayable. If that is the case, both debtors and creditors should bear the burden together. It's not given to the debtors exclusively. Because when debtors had a contract with the debtors, the creditors knew that there is a possibility that this can be a kind of risky business, right? So you knew about it. So from a some certain reciprocal principle, which is a fundamental moral principle, when the debt turns out to be insolvent, both creditors 
and debtors are supposed to take that financial burden. But actually, the example is all these, you know, you know, chapter seven, chapter nine, chapter eleven, and third, and all these, you know, bankruptcy code, basically based on that principle, actually. So it really works. Now, finally, what about theology? Right? We are doing theology here, and I realized at least in two aspects, theology can contribute the uh, reconstruction of um, the ethics of that. The first one is um, God's giftfulness. Um, this is my argumentation. Theology should radicalize the insight, the moral insight developed by anthropologists. According to anthropologists, you know, the, that is a form of gift Actually, the concept drawn from, you know, archaic society and theology, we argue, not from archaic society, but from the giftful God. God's giftfulness is a theology developed by, by many actually theologians. You know, Thomas Aachen was talking about it, and Carbart was talking about that, and many people. And recently, I think uh, John Luke Marion was talking about it, and. The major uh, theologians that I had a conversation with is Catherine Tanner and Stephen Webb. And Catherine Tanner uh, published a book, um, I think it's Economy of Grace, right? In the book, her basic argumentation is God is basically giftful God. From creation to salvation, from covenant to eschatology, God is always gift giving. So gift, gift giving or giftfulness is God's central character. And from an ethical perspective, it's not just a, you know, a theological concept. God's giftfulness should be reflected in all areas of human lives, all relations. But the financialization has a, some sort of a theological argumentation. The theological argumentation is, in the world of finance, God's giftfulness will not going to be reflected. Debt and gift is totally severed in the world of finance. So that's a theological statement. And I'm arguing that from a theological perspective, God's giftedness should be reflected even in the world of economy of debt. So that must be a form of gift, reflecting God's giftedness. Now the second part, is something um, I really emphasize. Through my you know, um, several years of uh, research, I realized that that is composed of two elements, actually. One is logic, you know, economic logic. You borrow money, you pay. That kind of reciprocity logic is very strong. And the other part is story, actually. Story is an important element of that. I, that's, that's my discovery. All that has their unique stories. But what is going on in financialized world is they don't want to hear anything about their, your stories. You go to a bank and try to draw money from them, they're not going to ask any of your personal stories. What they want is check out the money and bring back the money with interest. They don't want to hear your story. But I argue, from an ethical perspective, stories must be heard and accounted for and addressed. And church and community and schools are supposed to be the place where their stories are supposed to be heard. So I have a, a one a very short stories in here. And this is an example of what the story I mean. Hi, my name is William Burkholz. And as you can see from the posters that I'm holding up in front of you, I borrowed $44,000 of student loan money to get my master's degree in psychology. Over the years, I paid back $31,000 in interest. I do not know how much money I paid back that went to the principal of my loans. I do know that right now I'm on my last deferment and that I owe over $128,000. That's as of about four months ago, and it's climbing at about $950 a month. Each month I'm unable to pay. 
Prior to getting my master's, I never borrowed money from student loans. I either used a GI Bill or I worked part-time during uh, community college and I worked full-time uh, while I was getting my bachelor's degree. In just a few months, I'm going to turn 62 years old. I've been attempting to pay off my student loan debt for 20 years. I was told over and over again that I could not make partial payments. I could either pay the maximum amount of a loan, which grew over the years, or I could have my loan in deferment. I've worked at times four jobs at one time to try to pay back the student loan debt. Facing turning 62 and knowing I have another 30 years to pay on my student loans is daunting. I also have a number of health issues. What my life will look like in six months to a year, will I be able to afford to pay rent when my wages are garnished? Will I be able to have health insurance? At this point, looking back on my life, I wish I hadn't borrowed that money. I not only majored in psychology, I majored in debt. So when I was talking about the stories, that is ingredients, essential part of the debt is that kind of story. I think the church uh, should be uh, the major agencies that transformed this abusive story into a, you know, story of salvation, basically. So, what I'm trying to do, I would like to offer a theological and ecclesial vision of transformation from the win-loss structure of neoliberal economy, will debtor turns out to be a de facto loser and creditor as a winner, should be transformed into the situation, the context, in which the win-win structural economy of grace should be realized. I mean, the, the concept of the economy of grace is not my term. This is Kathleen Tanner's term. But here, what I'm arguing is that in this new paradigm, we have to realize that not as a loser, but as a giver. And also creditor, yes, as well you know, they should be a giver. So this is the theological transformation that I would like to, um, you know, arguing for as the, um, sort of like a moral vision that the uh, uh, reconstruction of the ethics of that uh, should do uh, down the road. So this is my conclusion. The debt is not an amoral financial commodity. It is quintessentially a moral entity. We have to revive the rich, you know, uh, meanings of the credit. Credit is not just a monetary, you know, capital. Credit is supposed to be a moral capital too. The symbolic capital, you know, Pierre Bourdieu was talking about. And the second one is all that have their stories. They are to be heard, accounted for, and addressed. I think, um, you know, our church and our ministry is the place where these stories should be transformed. As a result, God's giftedness is going to be reflected in these transforming stories. The third argumentation is, the purpose of that is not for its repayment. It is for helping us to live a life of giving, a, transform, a transformative life. I think that's the, uh, the viable vision that we have. We all should strive uh, after. All right, thank you very much for your time. I hope you find it interesting. We have some time for uh, questions. Not the kind asked in Parliament. Let me just start off whether they're, why they're thinking. Um, on your third principle of the conclusion, okay. uh, just a clarifying question. Yes. Yeah. It's to enable other kinds of things. Yeah. So if you don't repay debt, no one's going to loan. <laughs> yeah, so, so what does it mean that, you know, uh, the purpose of debt is, is life or giving? Okay, here is one example. Mm -hmm. All right, um, you know, Martha Nussbaum, in, in her book, um, you know, um, I forgot the title of the book, in her book, she was talking about 
a Indian woman whose name was Vasanti. Vasanti was the uh, the victim of um, you know domestic violence, and she left home and she was on her own. But Indian society, if you are alone, you are in very precarious situation because you don't have jobs basically. Luckily, she drew uh, the money from you know non-government organizations, so on, and then she. After borrowing the money from the SOA with lower interest charge, and she was able to educate herself, and then she paid back her own debt to SOA the organization. Later, she, you know, launched her own business, and then she made a life, and she is having another, you know, kind of family, and then helping out people basically. So what I'm talking about, the purpose of that is helping actually people to a life of giving. But financialization and its sort of like ideological impact means kind of delimiting our kind of a moral imagination. So here is a real problem. If you are in debt, then your mindset is working this way. I'm a debtor, and how can I become a giver? So I'm going to defer my kind of a call to be a giver until all my debt is going to be paid back. So that kind of a mindset, it's, it's, it's what I argue, is kind of a colonized mind because of the financialization. So do you think that this is kind of an answer to your question? So we have to kind of re-understand the purpose of debt. It is not just about borrowing and paying kind of things. There, there is a sort of more fundamental and overarching kind of theology of debt. The debt should serve humanity and the economy of gift, actually. Right. Wait, wait, wait. I have a question about uh, Deuteronomy, the political laws around Jubilee and the forgiveness of debt in yes. the seventh year. Yes. Can you, sp can you speak to that um, yes, theologically? And then my second question is, what needs to happen with people who run institutions like Goldman Sachs to help them rethink around this life-giving framework. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, great. You know, my presentation is based on chapter one, two, and six. Chapter five is all about uh, Judaism, and chapter four is Islamic kind of a banking system and stuff. I don't say anything about Islamic banking and Jewish, you know, um, you know ethics of that. Yes, the concept of jubilee is huge, and then it is all about the repayment or the, uh, you know, uh, the forgiveness of that. So I think the forgiveness of that is ingredient, part of the ethics of that. When the debt is not forgivable, I mean unpayable, and that debt should not be a mechanism of abusing people, and that debt should be forgiven. But in ancient Jewish you know, society, it was not worked that well. So God's kind of intervention is, that's enough. Not anymore. That shouldn't be used as a form of abuse. That is something God's kind of, a, uh, kind of unusual intervention into human um, kind of activity and business. And this is not allowed. So we have this uh, you know, very important tradition, which is back to, you know, grounded in, in you know, um, uh, theology. But I would like to talk about this case. I know the case of BAPCPA, what is that? In 2005, the Congress, they passed a law, um, you know, bankruptcy, you know, abuse prevention and con uh, consumer protection act. You know, basically what happened in 2005, student debt is now unforgivable, actually. That was the law we made in 2005. And I think that is a very problematic law. And then I read on articles and research and back stuff at the time. And actually, the, the bankers and these, you know, uh, these finan financial people, they actually used more than $100 million as a lobby money. We have to see that in uh, Washington, we have over 15,000 lobbyists. We have only about 535 lawmakers, right? So basically, our lawmakers are surrounded and insured by all these lobbyists, actually. So we know this is a democratic society, but not really. The people who got so much money, they control behind. They are really, actually, real lawmakers. 
I'm really concerned about that. But 2005, that law was real bad. But actually, in the United States, before 1977, all student, uh, student debt, if it is unpayable, it was forgivable. So 1977, we changed the law a little bit. So students are supposed to work hard to pay back up, up to five years. And in 1998, it, you know, um, it turned into seven years. And 2005, now it is impossible. This is the kind of the, uh, you know, you know, the madness of all this you know, um, you know, financialization. And I think the, we Christians and church, we were so naive. We were just sitting in our place, didn't do anything about that. I mean, this is bad. This is, uh, this is problematic. When it comes to Goldman Sachs, or this Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch and Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, all these kind of investment bankers, to be honest, I really don't know. Because how can we change these top you know, guys? And oh, Their mindset is very, very different. Uh, there was two newspaper ar articles written by the Wall Street people, actually. Um, these Wall Street people, they were actually hired by these top guys, you know, these top managers. And they finally said, you know, newspaper article is, oh, that's a little too much. It's enough. I'm leaving Wall Street kind of art, you know, argumentation, that, that article. And they were pressured by these top managers and their argumentation. Now you are in a real game. Now, what are we going to do? You will find. We're going to cover you. Just go ahead and do. And these are you know, math geeks, and they are creating all these kind of, kind of computer programs and creating new kind of a financial kind of property and stuff like that. So from my perspective, instead of changing them, I think we, the people, are supposed to work together power to power kind of game. I think that's the only thing, uh, in my understanding. I don't, I'm not sure if you agree with me. OK. <laughs> right. Thanks, Doctor. Um, the question I have is, um, the, uh, one of the tenants you have is repayability? The payability, yes. Yeah, and, and so the challenge here, I would ask, is yes. how do you balance that with the idea that sometimes, specifically student loans, yes. you can't get at that idea mm -hmm. yet, right? Because part of it is some of those un unearned wages in the f are in the future, right. and we don't know what that outcome is going to be. But even more pressing, that sometimes the people that need that those loan aid, yes. specifically for education, are going to be the people that, at least on paper, historically, would not be payable, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, people who are coming from low-income families, maybe uh, ethnic racial minorities, and these were historically, credit wouldn't look worthy, mm -hmm. right? So how do you balance that uh, in terms of repayability? Mm -hmm. All right, I think the part of the answer, I mean, that's a very you know, difficult and but well, at the same time, a good question. Um, there is a sort of like a new kind of bank movement that is like a community bank movement, actually. So instead of drawing money from this uh, kind of a nationally chartered banks, we, also, we should think about you know, creating a community bank. According to community bank, they're going to have a lower kind of interest rate. And then if something happens, they're going to give you some other leeway. So maybe 10 years, maybe kind of lengthen to like 20 years or something like that. So what is going on in today's world is that this kind of system is like there's no leeway. If you're not going to pay your student loan, you are in trouble for the rest of your life. You have to work hard to pay you know, your debt. You know, that kind of a, the rigidness. So my argumentation is that that rigidness is causing a lot of you know, financial injustice. We have to, because at the end of the day, the law really matters. And as these people are changing the law, the APCPA, we people can actually change the law so this debt can be a payable down the road by changing the system. Um, I think uh, the, the case of you know, German, uh, Germany and you know, England and Sweden and Austria and other you know, um, you know, first world countries, their student loan system is something, I think, far better than ours. So in Australia, if we're going to have that system, you know, until, you know, for example, the United States, we, if we have the similar kind of system, yes, I have a debt here, but I don't have to be pressured. You don't have to pay like 10, 000, you know, half of your salaries right after your graduation for the sake of paying all this debt. That's, your life is basically doomed. You're not going to make your own life with that payment. 
For example, in Australia, even though you make like $40,000, they kind of, uh, the money is automatically deducted after your, you know, kind of money, like up to five persons, actually, something like that. So I, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm giving you the answer, but probably my answer is it's all matters at the end of the day about politics. If we change the politics, change the law, probably the student law and this problem can be you know, uh, differently you know, uh, you know, approached it and resolved at the end of the day. Before 1977, when we had a problem with the student law and insolvent, your debt could be entirely forgiven. I mean, why don't we kind of revive that kind of system, given the fact we have a one point three trillion dollars and then there is a secret market based on the student kind of a loan known as SLAB, S L A B. It's a huge because the financiers they realize that well this debt is not gonna be uh, you know forgivable. So they are giving more and more you know student loans to the students. So students part, on our part, your part, you should be smart. You should read their mind. So you know this loan is supposed to be the minimal even though they said that you can you know, loan more and more and more. That will in, you know, eventually is some kind of financial bubble and then we're gonna be in trouble too. So uh, the law and politics should be engaged in this case. From student individual side, try to minimize as much as you can. You know, I think it's, uh, that is kind of practical kind of, you know, advice that I can offer. Maybe I have one more, one more question perhaps, I don't know. Professor Bryant, you have the honor of Sounds to me like a struggle between mammon and the kingdom of God. And to that extent, the legal is not always moral. And what I s hear you suggesting is that there's some sort of financial reform to try and bring the two closer together. So my fir first question is what changes do you see um, or would suggest in the banking system to try and reconcile the legal and the moral? Uh, and secondly, have you given any consideration to the Islamic system of banking as sort of a different model to yes. look at as opposed to the Western model? Okay, let, let me tackle with the second question, the Islamic model. What I learned from the Islamic model is that actually Islamic model, they really care about the story. I think that's a really good thing. When you're going to uh, loan the money from Islamic bank, they actually look into the stories and what are you going to do with this money? Because uh, Sharia law, the Islamic, you know, Quran, they actually, the, the basic understanding of the debt is that is not supposed to be abusive kind of, you know, the mechanism. That is sub supposed to be a service to the people. So one example is that, you know, the liba, anti-liba, that means interest is no. You cannot liba any interest according to Islamic bank. But you should make some kind of, you know, a profit. So they come up with many different kind of a mechanism, like a musharaka, some kind of a banking system. But what we learn from the Islamic banking system is that by eradicating uh, the interest, they actually try to um, sort of like uh, minimize the vicious spirit of uh, this economy of that. So. Um, 2007 and 8, when we had a financial you know, problems, many banks you know, struggled, and a lot of uh, Islamic banks actually they maintain their business. You know, basically, the Islamic bank for the past 30 years they have very short kind of history, but kind of a growing kind of a trend. So, I think they provide provide us very important kind of a ethical insight about the relationship between law and morality. You know, um, this is. Kind of a, it requires me another lecture. I think this is just huge. I mean, it's pretty too deep, you know, large questions. Well, my point is that, um, um, in a very simplistic way, the moral insight we can draw from anthropology, politics, you know, religions, should uh, should you know put together all the way. And in the way of changing the law in a more humane way. That's what I'm really trying to argue. So basically my final argumentation is with regard to the case of you know, economy of debt, we need a total ethics, not just a, you know, utilitarianism, not you know, a Kantian deontology or Aristotelian you know, communitarian approach. No, no. We need all wisdoms from all walks of life, all you know, available sources. That's why I try to because of my limitation, I couldn't talk about Hinduism and other sources. But 
at least you know Abrahamic you know religious traditions and anthropology, economics because there are some good economics too, and also philosophy. I really try to bring up some sort of like a total ethics because the problem with that is so huge. It just covers everywhere. Not a single ethical approach cannot deal with that. I mean, we need combine all human wisdom together in fighting against this, you know, kind of 21st century uh, neoliberal kind of a you know dominance of money. So you know that. Well, uh, I hope I answer your question. Professor Ron, thank you for spending okay, time. Thank you so much.